This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. And today I wanted to talk about what are called stranded sats and the Lightning Network. If you haven't been following the channel, you should go back and watch the last two days of videos, stranded sats and UTXO management. It's actually, actually much more important and interesting than it sounds, followed up by how to calculate Bitcoin transaction fees. But the basic summary, an example of stranded sats or satoshis, there's 100 million satoshis in one Bitcoin. An example of a stranded sat uh, UTXO would be a 100,000 sat UTXO, which is just a name for a chunk of Bitcoin that hasn't been spent yet. And let's say that that is 100,000 sat UTXO and the transaction fee to send that chunk is 100,000 sat. So it doesn't make sense to pay $45 in fees in order to send about $45 of value. It doesn't even make that much sense to spend $10 in fees to send $45 in value. That'd be a 22% fee, which is very high by TradFi standards. So that's why these chunks are called, they can be called stranded sats or sometimes called dust or economically unspendable Bitcoin UTXOs as Jameson Lopp calls them. This is a great essay you can check out as well. Now, stranded sats, it's important to remember that this is not necessarily a permanent phenomenon because they can become unstranded if transaction fee rates fall again. So one solution to a stranded UTXO is simply to wait for lower fees. 100,000 sat UTXO stranded when the transaction fee is 100,000 sats. If fee rates fall, that UTXO is not nearly as stranded when the transaction fee is 2,000 sats. That would be a 2% transaction fee. And again, in Bitcoin, you are charged a transaction fee based on how much data your transaction takes up in the block space. It's not a percentage as it would be, for example, with a credit card payment or something like that. So stranded sats can become unstranded and then they can become stranded again. And that's why it's important to begin to pay attention to the Bitcoin fee market as we've talked about in the last two videos. So how to mitigate this, how to mitigate and protect yourself against your sats being stranded in the future. One way, as we talked about when we were talking about UTXO consolidation in the last two videos, you combine small UTXOs into larger UTXOs when fees, when Bitcoin base layer transaction fees are low. And the way you do this is you just send a bunch of small UTXO inputs back to a new receive address generated by your wallet. And if you watch those previous two videos, I show you how to do this using the Sparrow wallet, for example, and any hardware wallet of your choice. So that's one choice. You can combine smaller UTXOs into larger UTXOs, and there are privacy implications when it comes to that, which I talked about in the previous two videos. The other way of mitigating against stranded sats is you just don't withdraw small UTXOs from the exchange. Let them build up into larger a larger amount. So for example, if you're daily dollar cost averaging or weekly dollar cost averaging, you wait until you have 500,000 sats or a million sats is probably even better sitting on the exchange and then withdraw it. And when you withdraw it, no matter how you bought it, even if you bought it in lots of little chunks, it will be sent to you as one single fat UTXO or chunk of Bitcoin. Now this does involve taking on some custodian risk while your sats are sitting on the exchange. So you do need to think about that as one of the trade-offs. But if most of your Bitcoin is in cold storage and you're buying another, let's say you have $10,000 worth of Bitcoin in cold storage and you're buying another $250 worth of Bitcoin on the exchange, if you were to get rugged on that while you're waiting to pull it off the exchange, it's not the end of the world, it's not a good thing, uh, but that's one way of thinking about it. You obviously don't wanna leave uh, the majority of your sats on exchanges. If you wanna get a feeling for how much 500,000 sats is, I'll link to this calculator as well. It makes it real easy, or you can do the math in your head. So 500,000 sats is about $225. And so a million sats would be approximately, uh, call it 400, uh, 450, dollars just to give you an idea of the fiat values. Now there's a good good question from Nick Leo on one of those previous videos. If you have stranded sats, could you simply spend them using the Lightning network? The short answer is yes you could, but the big problem is how to get them onto the Lightning network. That can require an on-chain transaction. I'll be covering this soon. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. When we're talking about the Bitcoin network, the base layer, on-chain, layer one, these are different interchangeable terms. That's talking about the Bitcoin network. The Lightning Network is a layer two solution that is built on top of this base layer of Bitcoin. So you have layer one, the Bitcoin network, layer two, the Lightning Network. You can also think of these in terms of just being different payment rails, if that metaphor is more helpful. Now, Lightning is an open protocol that anyone can use, just like anyone can use Bitcoin's base layer. It's very important to emphasize this because you'll often hear the opposite from ship coiners, but Lightning is a protocol. It's not a company. It's not controlled by a single corporation like Lightning Labs in spite of the name. Lightning Network, unlike the Bitcoin 
network and which has a blockchain the lightning network it's a network of payment channels and so when you open up a payment channel with someone else bitcoin gets locked up on the base layer on on chain on layer one and so by doing this you're not creating new bitcoin out of thin air and thus violating the 21 million max supply you're locking up bitcoin on chain in order to be able to use it on the second layer and you don't need to lock it up on chain sometimes you can jump directly into the second layer and start using bitcoin that someone else has loaded into the bitcoin in, i'm sorry into the lightning network if you want to think about it that way here's an example of a payment channel robert and alice for example could set up a payment channel on the lightning network and here's an example of using interconnecting payment channels to route money from robert through alice to john so if alice and john have a channel and robert and alice have a channel robert is able to send bitcoin over the lightning network from himself through alice to john and you can get very complicated versions of this here's a representation of the lightning network as we speak there are over 13,000 nodes there's uh, 5,000 Bitcoin tied up on it. And this is a misleading number. This is only $226 million. You can have a lot of payments going back and forth just using this sort of base money. And so you could actually have billions or even trillions of dollars of transactions going on, even with such low capacity because the money's being sent back and forth. It's currently 58, 59,000 payment channels in the Lightning Network. Now, sending Bitcoin over the Lightning Network can be a great experience for two reasons. It's really, really fast and it's really cheap. You usually end up spending less than a penny to send a transaction, but it's definitely not perfect because sometimes your payment cannot find its way across the network due to routing or liquidity issues, which we're going to be talking about in a later video. But here's another problem. In order to open up a Lightning payment channel with someone or with a company, you need to do a two of two multi-sig transaction on the base layer, on layer one. And then to close that Lightning payment channel and to have everything settle back on the base layer, you need to do another two of two multi-sig transaction on the base layer. If your channel partner, the, your payment channel partner cheats or goes offline for too long, you may need to do what's called a forced close of the payment channel, which requires a transaction on the base layer. And also if you want to add funds to a payment channel, in other, in other words, splice in some sats, this is called splicing, you need to, to do another transaction on the base layer. So you're, you're beginning to pick up on the common denominator here, which is one or more transactions on the base layer. And this is okay in a low to medium fee environment, but it could get really bad in a high fee environment and you end up with the same problem where you have stranded sats and you can't even get them onto the lightning network because that base layer fee might exceed or be too large a percentage of the underlying value of the UTXO. So this is the thing, this is the answer to Nick Leo's question, these stranded sats, you need to either consolidate them, do something about them, get them on the Lightning Network. And there's no way, there's no easy way to get to the Lightning Network once fees are already high on the base layer. So one strategy here is to move some of your future spending sats out of cold storage from the base layer onto the Lightning Network when Bitcoin base layer transaction fees are low. Now, again, when I say you should never spend your Bitcoin, sometimes people get confused by this, and I, I still maintain that. But if you reach the point where, where you're living on Bitcoin, you're earning Bitcoin, you're spending Bitcoin, there's no reason uh, to say someone's doing something wrong there because they basically have their whole net worth in Bitcoin. And you do have fiat bills. You do have bills in the real world. And in this case, you would need to spend Bitcoin. So I'm not talking about set spending your long-term savings, but I'm talking about as you begin to live more and more on a Bitcoin standard, and also as you begin to look forward and saying, I'm not spending my Bitcoin now, but in 10 years from now, maybe it would be good to have some of this Bitcoin on another layer. And there are ways to get from the base layer to Lightning. You can use an atomic swap like Bolts offers. The way this works is they charge a fee. Bolts charges a very small fee. They also charge a network fee, which is just the minor transaction fee on the base layer, which we've been talking about. So if you were to do this today, right now, the network fee is quite large as a percentage of the amount of Bitcoin I want to move. So this is 100,000 Satoshis. The network fee, the minor transaction fee is 25,000. So that's a 25% fee, which is crazy. But what you can see here is if we just add a zero to this, it really is not a function of the value. So the bolts fee goes up a little bit. That is a percentage of the value, but still 974 sats is really nothing. But if I'm trying to move a million Satoshis from the base layer, to Lightning, that network fee, that transaction fee stays the same on Bolts here. So now instead of being um, 25%, it's just 2.5% of the total. And that's a much 
better, uh, much better, more reasonable uh, rate. The other way to do it is you can use a, a non-custodial or self-custodial Lightning wallet like Phoenix, which we're going to be talking more about. And they now have a really nice feature where you can open up inbound liquidity channels, which I also want to talk about. I think this video has gotten long enough, so I will talk about this in a subsequent video. But these are two different ways, Bolts, and then using some of these wallets. These are ways of getting some of your sats onto the Lightning Network and preventing them thereby from being stranded, getting them on the Lightning Network where you can then spend at some point in the future. And you can spend very cheaply once you've uploaded them to the Lightning Network. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.